Today's scripture lesson is from John chapter four, verses seven through 26. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink? Although I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus replied to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank it of himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw water. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This which you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and yet you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one must worship. Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. The word of God for the people of God. As we read this morning, we see Jesus traveling from Judea to Galilee. Now, if you could imagine modern-day map of Israel, the southern part where Jerusalem is, they called in those days Judea. If you go all the way up, you see the little, uh, we call lake, but uh, they called in the Bible Sea of Galilee. That's where all the region around the Sea of Galilee, they called Galilee. So in the middle, the region called Samaria at the time of Jesus. So Jesus was traveling from Judea, from the southern part, to the north, to Galilee. So you had to pass through the region of Samaria. So that's the context of today's text. So they arrived at a village called Sukkar. It was not a Jewish town where a different race lived. They were called Samaritans. You heard of the story of Good Samaritan, yes, the same Samaritan from the same region. It was midday, around noon, very hot. Jesus and his disciples had walked all morning to arrive there, so they were tired and they were hungry. To get some food, Jesus, the master, sent his disciples to the town. And he was waiting for them and resting at a well. A Samaritan woman approached the well to draw the water. To her, Jesus asked if she could give him a drink. And the whole conversation followed. So let's check out how the conversation turned out. Once again, I will lead you in today's text verse by verse. So I encourage you to look at the bulletin, the scripture lesson, as you follow along. Verse seven, a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. 
Note here that it was Jesus who initiated the conversation, not the woman. If Jesus didn't say anything, perhaps the woman would not have said anything either. Here, Jesus surely has something in his mind, more than just to quench his thirst with H2O for his body. Something far more important, something that matters eternally, something that the woman and everyone else needs. Now keep in mind, Jesus' request here to give me something to drink later turns into the woman's request this time, give me that living water in verse 15. In verse 9, so the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink? Though I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. A little bit of historical background on Samaritans and Jews would help us to understand the text better. Originally, there were one people the descendants of Jacob. All of them called Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham our forefathers. They started from one family. Jacob, their forefather, lived around 2000 before Christ was born. And his descendants went down to Egypt and served there as slaves for the next 400 some years. So by the time they came out of Egypt, we call the Exodus, it was around 1500 BC. That's when Moses was active too. 500 years later, King David reigned in the kingdom of Israel. He was the second king. First king was Saul. Solomon, his son, reigned for the next 40 years. Around 930 BC, at the time of Solomon's son, whose name was Rehoboam, the kingdom was split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom they called the kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom they called kingdom of Judah because the 10 tribes followed the northern kingdom split from the David's kingdom. However, two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, they stick with the Solomon's son called kingdom of Judah. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom fell into the hands of the Assyrians, modern-day Iraq, who took many Israelites into exile, and they brought a different race into the region whose capital was Samaria. That's why they started calling that Samaria region and Samaritans. Soon, between the two different races, the remnants of the land and the foreigners who had been brought in, they bingled together and they had interracial marriage, you know, it happens for the next several hundred years. There was a mixture in the religion as well as culture until the time of Jesus. Samaritans were the direct descendants who dwelled in that territory ever since. What happened to the kingdom in the south? They lasted another 150 years after the fall of the northern kingdom. In the year of 587 before Christ was born, they met the same fate as its northern neighbor. This time, not the Assyrians, but the Babylonians. Same region, Iraq and Iran, that, the mighty kingdom at the time. Babylonians from the north invaded and carried the Jews into exile is known to us as the Babylonian captivity. If you love the history, you heard of that term before. So after Jewish descendants of the exile returned 70 years later, they settled and went back to their homeland around Jerusalem, Judea. By then the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along well. Although both races worshiped the Lord Jehovah as their God, neither of them acknowledged the other's religion as the legitimate faith in the Lord. For instance, the Jews insisted that Mount Zion, Temple Mount in Jerusalem is the place of worship. That's where the temple of, you know, 
God was standing and destroyed later on. Yet the Samaritans said, no, Mount Gerizim in Samaria is the most sacred mountain where the Jews must come up and worship. Jews despised Samaritans as a mixed race and considered them unkosher, both in blood and in faith. Samaritans, on the other hand, resented such treatment from the Jews. Naturally, no transactions or dealings took place between the two races. That's the background of today's story. Let's go to verse 10. Jesus replied to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Isn't that amazing? After two sentences into the conversation, Jesus already talking about the gift of God, the Messiah, and the living water. The woman by now was intrigued. Verse 11, she said to Jesus, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? The lady already sized up Jesus here. We are talking about water here, right? She said, you have nothing to draw the water with and the well is deep. How are you going to get the water? Furthermore, where are you going to get that living water, let alone giving it to me? The woman continues in verse 12, you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Here's a Greek grammar here. What she was saying to Jesus is that, I know you are not greater than Jacob. Just admit it. That's the Greek grammar's, you know, the tone. She expected an admission from Jesus. Yes, I'm not that great, you know, not greater than your forefather Jacob. She was, in fact, telling Christ that he is not greater than Jacob. How often we fall into this wrong kind of assumption that Christ is not that great. Now, if you talk to average American today, between Christ and other good moral teachers like Socrates and Confucius and Gandhi and whatnot, many of them would say, yeah, yeah, they're equal rank. Christ as good as, you know, other teachers, but not that great. Okay, let's not fall into this category of putting God in our own box, shall we? Of course, the lady had no clue who she was talking to here or what Jesus was talking about. So in verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I'll give him shall never be thirsty. But the water that I'll give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus talks about the living water here that will lead us to eternal life. It surely got the woman's attention when he said, you never go thirsty if you get this water. So in verse 15, the woman said to Jesus, Sir, give me that water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw water. Have you noticed here now Jesus started give me something to drink at the beginning. Now she's asking, sir, give me that water, right? You know, I think that's how it usually works in our faith journey. If you remember the first time you became a Christian, you believe in Jesus Christ, we think that God is asking too much of us coming to church on Sunday, worship and obey his voice and you know, pray and read the Bible and so forth. In the end, however, we want more from the same God, the things that we used to avoid. We want to worship the Lord on a regular basis once a week and pray more and the word of God we get into more and more. In verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered, said to him, I have no husband. Can you imagine someone just poking your not great spot in your life? <laughs> it 
Jesus knew. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband either. This which you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. No one told you about my background. How did you know, right? Here's another thing, folks. Jesus already knows everything about your life and mine. We don't have to tell him. He knows everything. Now, this conversation convinced the woman that he is a a true prophet, but Jesus himself is much more than a prophet, greater than any other prophets. Did you know that all the prophecies in the Bible point out to one person whose name is Jesus the Christ? He is that great. Let's talk about the woman who had five husbands and living with another man. In my humble opinion, she had been looking for meaning and satisfaction through the marriage relationship. Yet, we could tell she did not find. Even after five husbands, she keeps trying. You know what? It tells me that no human can satisfy the need of your soul or mine. Only God can. French philosopher and theologian whose name is Blaise Pascal, he once said that there is a hole or void, if you will, in every human heart that no one can fill but God himself. Now listen to his own writing. I quote, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim, but that there was once in man and person a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there, the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. You see that? No matter how any human beings or anything you pursue to fill that gap of the void and emptiness in your heart, nothing and no one can do but God himself. That's what Jesus is talking about here. So the woman continues in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and yet you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we one must go and worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. Have you noticed Jesus saying, some people worship what they do not know? How true it is. Jesus continues, salvation is from the Jews. Once again, God sent the Savior in the Jewish line. Nothing against any other races, just that's the people the Lord God has chosen to be his own at the beginning, to be his treasured possession. And later on, he extended the salvation to the Gentiles as well. However, the Messiah came from that line. By the way, God's such salvation plan of God was made before the creation of the world. It was God's plan. Jesus continues in verse 23, but a time is coming and even now has arrived when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth And for such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will uh, declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. In my own woman, you're just looking at that Messiah. That would be my line. 
As I said, at the end of the conversation, the woman going to the Messiah, you know that when Messiah comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus says, I am the Messiah. If you read the scripture, you'll find in the Gospels, oftentimes Jesus did not reveal his true identity, not in the public, not easily. He only let his disciples in private know who he was until the right time. But here, first time they ever met to this Samaritan woman, Jesus says, I am the Messiah. From today's text, I'm going to point out two lessons very briefly. The first one is this. Christ, the Messiah, is for all people, not just for the Jews. The second one is the Holy Spirit is for all people. Christ came to this earth not for Jews alone, but Christ, he also came to die for Samaritans, both Jews and Gentiles, both the righteous and the unrighteous, for the Americans and Chinese, if you will, Russians or even Ukrainians. He came to save all sinners from their sins. The second one is this Holy Spirit is for all people. Let me read verse 13 and 14 one more time. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I'll give him shall never be thirsty. The water that I'll give him will become in him fountain of water, spring up to eternal life. Jesus refers to here the Holy Spirit who dwells in our heart from the Holy Spirit in us we'll have a well of living water that will quench our spiritual thirst. Folks, do, do not think that today's story is just that one good story, isn't it? Jesus talking to a woman, a Samaritan. That's it? No, folks. Jesus talks about talking about your eternal life, the Holy Spirit. My question for all of us, myself included, Do I have the Holy Spirit? Do I have the living water in me that will lead me to eternal life? Yes, that's good. Good answer. Until you can positively say that, yes, I do have the Holy Spirit in me. Yes, I do have a living water in me that will lead me into eternal life. If someone asks you, do you have eternal life? What did you answer? I'll have to wait until I die. I'll find out then. No. No. You do have eternal life in you. You're living the life that's going to continue on. Eternal life doesn't start when you physically die. Are you with me? How many of you are sure that you have the Holy Spirit in you? Raise your hand. Some of us are not sure. How do you tell you have the Holy Spirit? Some people came to me one time and said, Pastor, I don't feel anything. Where is the Holy Spirit? Is it in, the Bible says, he's in my heart. I don't feel anything in my heart. Did you know that Holy Spirit? Spirit doesn't take any space. He doesn't take any three-dimensional space. Therefore, you don't feel anything. Are you with me? In other words, do not go with your feelings whether you have the Holy Spirit or not. I'd rather go with God's promise, unchanging promise, that Holy Spirit is in you and in your heart. That's the promise. That's how I know. Here's another thing. The Bible says, whether you know you have the Holy Spirit or not, here's the test. Can you say that Jesus Christ is your Savior? He died on your behalf for your sins, right? Do you believe it in your heart? then you do have the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Bible says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You speak to any average Christian of the person out there. Do you believe Jesus Christ died for you and he is your Savior? Not everyone can say that. With Only with what? The help of the Holy Spirit. You could say that. No one can say Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? This is Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So as for closing, I will say this. I recommend you studying today's text. 
Don't throw the you know, bulletin away on your way out. Take it home with you and read at least a couple more times. Go slow. Pay attention to the words of Jesus such as living water, eternal life, and the Messiah, folks. Ask yourself, by the way, Christ is talking not just to this Samaritan woman in the text, but he's talking to you about your salvation, your eternal life. He's talking about the Holy Spirit in you. The same Spirit of God will fill your emptiness and quench your thirst that no others can. You'll never go thirsty. Let's bow as in prayer.